All righty, let's rock and roll. You're listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. This is um, edition 166 of Changing Reality, where I try to do the most important things. And it is March the 14th, uh, year of our Lord, 2013. And as is normal, at the end of the week, Thursday night going into Friday, we have Black Star Thursday with Terrell 03. And so I don't want to waste any more time. So Terrell, are you, uh, are you up and ready to go? Yes, sir. Testing, testing. One, two, three. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can. Just let you know, you know, what we all, uh, prayers went out to you from this station for your mom and everything for, uh, last week. So, um, you know, sorry about your loss. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I'm, um, I'm, if, you, if people that know me know that I'm pretty much emotionally detached from everything. It makes me a good researcher. Um, it's because of my past and this and that. But it was impossible for me to detach myself. I was overwhelmed. It was impossible. Thursdays, for, for some reasons, for about the last year, have been bad days for me, a lot of them in a row. And to add to it today, my cousin that was at the funeral, she passed away this Thursday. So it's a stroke of bad luck, but I need to engage myself in my work and there's a lot of stuff to share with you guys. Thank you very much for, for thinking about me and my family through this period. And uh, I apologize if I'm a little bit off, but I'm going to give you the best report that I can. And uh, there is quite a bit of information. I'm at a uh, point where I'm having to recalibrate, I'm having to reformulate my hypothesis. Um, there are knowns. There are things that I know. And there are things that I don't I have not yet figured out that I'm working on. Um, some of the things that I know, the April 2nd event is going to happen. The, the pattern, just based upon the historical precedent, the pattern that's there. there the Earth is in less than three weeks now. Uh, we're going to have two more of these shows before the event. It's going to be on a Tuesday. It's going to be April 2nd. That's whenever the Earth is going to pass between the two objects, between the Sun and whatever's out there in the Virgo constellation. There is a trough. A gravity trough that's connecting the gravity well of the sun to the gravity well of whatever that the heck that thing is out there. I believe that it's a black dwarf star, could be a neutron star, carbon star, doesn't matter what it is. It's that's what's creating the Earth changes. That's what's creating the changes in our solar system. So that's a known that this event is going to take place. I was off by four days in 2011. I predicted the event was going to be March 15th. It turned out to be on the 11th. That was Fukushima. Last year I was off by about uh, 40 hours. That was Guerrero. And uh, uh, this year I think that I'm getting better at, be, at uh, being able to tell. This is the next day on the 180 day cycle. There's as much probability of it being late as early, as early to that date. But don't be surprised if it doesn't happen on April Fool's Day. Oh, and, you know, if, if the event happens a little bit early, that's been, um, that's been happening to me on this, this part of the cycle. So where we are right now, December 28th, 2012, then we were at the minimum that the Earth was at outside orbit position at the top of the orbit. That's when we started, if this is like a football game, the first quarter of the game. Then three months and three days later, that gets us to April the 2nd. So this is the time whenever the magnetic portal connection, that's an umbilical cord running between the sun and the Earth and between the secondary star and the Earth. So we have dual magnetic portal connections. That's when they made the right angle on December 28th. 2012, and then we started orbiting toward the object. So I was able to predict. Now this is where my uh, I'm having to do some recalibration because for six months I could tell you within five earthquakes how many. I'm not saying this is the total number, but this is the number that's reported by the USGS that's reporting about 30 percent of the earthquakes around the planet. I was able to predict within about five quakes how many we were going to have each week. That was from the back center of the back orbit, that's whenever we came into alignment on the back side, September 26, 2012, until December 28th, going downward. And then we reached the bottom on December 28th. There's a V in the chart, just exactly like I knew there would be, and it started coming back up again. Um, but something happened in the month of February that I, I the, the star that's coming out of the Virgo constellation is secondary. That's a secondary magnetic portal connection. It's going to be a smaller star. It's going to have a small, smaller magnetic portal connection. Okay. So when I'm looking at the data for solar cycle 23, I'm seeing a very high peak. I'm seeing a lot of sunspots. I'm seeing the, uh, the radio flux numbers high. 
And so they expected Solar Cycle 24 was going to be even bigger. Well, what, what's happening in reality, those flux numbers are about half. So imagine going back in time every 11 years, 12 years, sometimes nine years, you have a wave, a, a curve that goes up and then down and up and then down where these peaks are at the very top. Well, we're supposed to be at that top right now. And well, that's what I heard, Terrell. I heard that we're actually, the sun is actually doing a double peak where we peaked a few months ago, it went up and then it drops. And this is what's known as a double peak uh, solar cycle. But uh, just go ahead. Oh, yeah. When you go back and look at the historical precedent, then you're not going to see that kind of anomaly. But what they're, it's not a few months ago. It's at the end of 2011, they're calling a peak, which that's, that's possible. But what we, we don't have is the normal curve that we should be looking at. The, uh, and you're going to have to show me a second peak because we're not seeing it yet. They um, say June, July. We, we should start peaking now. Right, which... That's when we're supposed to. It's going to be 13 years if we make it to July from the last peak. Going back to 1900, there's not a 13-year period between any peaks. There are nine years, 10 years, 11 years, the longest is 12 years. So this will be the longest duration between solar cycle 23, the peak, and solar cycle 24. So um, what my point is that the sun, it's whenever it's robust, when it's highly active, then it's sending the earth high doses of magnetism, particularly in the months of January, February, because that's in the January, beginning of January is when Earth is nearest the sun. So proximity has something to do with this. That magnetic portal connection is connecting and disconnecting on eight-minute cycles. And each time that the Earth is near to the sun, more of those internal conduits, a higher percentage of them are active. So now we're moving actually away from the sun, and we're going to continue doing that until July the 4th. So there's decreased magnetism coming from the sun, and it's in a lull. So what I'm saying, all those words, what I'm saying is that the secondary magnetic portal connection is no longer viable. It's no longer, um, we, whenever we come between the two, the sun and the dark star, then that magnetic portal connection stops shortening because now we're going to pass between them and start moving towards outside orbit. And now that is unless it's already here. But the evidence seems to indicate, so there's another player in this game. And this would tend to make me believe that the, what I believe now is a binary twin. The evidence that's coming in for me is mounting in the direction that this is a binary twin. And I'm looking at Wait, the- What do you mean, wait a minute, Terrell, what do you mean a binary twin? I mean that this object, apparently, this is the way that my leading theory is, is leaning right now. This thing was a double, it was a bi binary twin to our sun. It was larger, very much larger than our sun whenever this solar system was young. But the larger stars burn out faster. So it burned up all of its its uh, fuel and then it imploded on itself and it created a dwarf star. So it's a now it's a dark binary twin. So this is the object that the ancients would describe as as uh, Nibiru, unless Nibiru that was a an orbital, unless this thing it maintain it has uh, some orbitals. It's a mini solar system. You know, there's a lot of conjecture about what the thing exactly is, but that this is what it appears to me is that this guy, it's right now in the Virgo constellation. The other consideration is that Saturn is also in the Virgo constellation. So this thing is closer to Saturn than it is to the Sun and to the Earth. And with, that, and with the Earth being farther away, that means Saturn is getting the magnetic portal connection between the secondary star and Saturn is going to be, there's much more of the magnetism that it's siphoning off is going to Saturn. So I would expect the temperatures on Saturn to be increasing because of the induction process. And that's going to siphon off the, mag the, the capability of the black star to give the Earth magnetism. So even though we've been orbiting towards the thing, and my charts, my predictive modeling, everything was right on until the month of February, and then things started dropping off. And I'm scratching my head going, why is this happening? So I believe that it's a dynamic situation. It has to do with the sun being in a lull, and also... This object being in Virgo, it's been moving from Leo to Virgo. Now it's firmly in Virgo constellation. Saturn's leaving Virgo, but it's still right there. This would tend to make me believe that the object, this dark star is coming in, is closer to Saturn than it is to the Earth, making me think that it's further away. In other words, that we're not going to anticipate an, an event in um, May the 17th. See, if this guy was very, very close, we would still be orbiting towards it. If it was very, very close the Earth would still be receiving high doses of magnetism. Saturn would not. 
because just imagine that there's a umbilical cord running over to Saturn and it's, it's, it's long because as this star is getting further away from it, the Earth is going to be receiving more. But if this thing is nearer to Saturn, then the Earth is going to be receiving less. And so whenever I'm looking at the variables involved, that's the only explanation that I can come up with at this time for the, the, the uh, lull in the earthquake activity. The, uh, the Earth changes appear to be slowing down at a point whenever they should be rising. The other thing is that I'm being led more to believe that the, uh, the sun is going to go black on us. The three days of darkness from prophecy, I, I have been explaining as the, the pole shift. In other words, whenever this object is between the Earth, is between whenever this object is between the Earth and the Sun, then the magnetism, the the conflict with the magnetic North Pole, tips the Earth backwards. So the peoples in the northern hemisphere get three days of darkness. Okay, but I'm now I'm being led away from that and more towards I'm looking at the Sun. I'm actually being led to believe that the Sun is more of a barometer than we've suspected. So the the coronal holes are getting larger and larger. And larger and larger. Just just imagine if the sun, if the holes completely covered the sun, then we would have darkness. And yeah, I'm, most people don't know, but the sun is actually black. When you look these coronal holes, the best way that you can understand that is like like a hurricane looking down through the eye of a hurricane, and you see the blue ocean through the eye. It's clear, and that's the actual color of the sun. Believe it or not, so. Uh, now, I never thought of that one, so the sun won't completely flame out, but it really wouldn't have to. It really wouldn't have to if the holes were numerous and big enough, really. What if the entire sun is darkened by this thing? In other words, the twin to our sun gets close enough to it, then the influence of that star itself puts out the fire of the sun. It's a black star, and the, the subatomic particles releasing are not under ignition. And um, this is what it, this is the way it appears to me right now. So this thing getting to the sun means the sun, the coronal holes get larger and larger and larger until it gets right next to the sun, and then the sun goes out. Whenever the star comes on around, and it m apparently must need to be in direct proximity to go all the way out, and then whenever it comes on around, then the uh, the sun lights up again, and then we then daytime starts again. Right. Well, now, there, that's that's of course those theory. You know, it could be that the pole shift is the answer, um, but on a crossing event, we're not necessarily going to get a pole shift. Right. Um, well, it's not going to be the the Earth tipping directly back from the sun. It could be the northern hemisphere it could be tipped toward the sun. See, right. so there's well, Terrell. Is there any is, is there any ancient writings that talk about the sun going black? Well, we'll have to look for that. But poleshift.com is probably the place to go. That's where you're going to see information on the three days of darkness. So just keyword three days of darkness. I haven't gone that route yet. And also Jesus did say there would be there would be signs in the heavens and the moon and the sun and the stars. So uh, he did talk about, you know, right at the end. Of course, you don't believe we're at the end. you got a new, uh, new eschatology. you got a different one than, than most. Uh, right. The... Um, most people, most professing Christians, they've mixed the water witness and the blood and the, the water witness and the blood witness in the New Testament together. They've mixed together the mystery and prophecy. The day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. That's what's about to start. The day of the Lord is a 3,600 year period. It's it's characterized in in, uh, in Peter and Revelation as the thousand years. But what that's a uh, that's a use of terms to say as long as it takes. So this is this is the way I'm looking. This this star came in for Noah. This star came in for Moses. This star is coming for the prophet of Acts 3, verses 22 and 23, that Moses says is like me. And then the day of the Lord starts. This star goes away. It goes out to its aphelion position, 1,800 years. It comes back, and here we go again. This star is coming in like it is right now at the end of the age. And they can't see it, just like we can't see it. It's the dark binary twin. And then... The prophecies of the prophecy part, the day of the Lord ends when this thing comes again. So if you look at scripture, then Elijah still has to come first. He still has to restore all things. Matthew 17, start at verse 10. And, the, and that's what Peter's saying in Acts chapter 3, verse 21. 
about right. the restoration of all things, and then talks about the prophet that's coming. That's the same prophet. So Israel, the last two verses of the of the Old Testament describe the same prophet, the same guy. That's Elijah. And he's coming to restore the hearts of the fathers to children. That's innocence. And the hearts of the children to their fathers. That's immortality. That's what he's coming to do right now with right. the coming well, of this dark star. Well, just on the dark star, if we can get back to that, you've got some other information, which is, which is really, this is probably the biggest information, confirmation that I've heard that this black star is coming through. So why don't you tell us the, the, the things that you found out, what the government's doing now uh, with the satellites and different things. Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> First of all, let me give you a little bit of the evidence. Um, I think we have time before the break to get all this in. The um, the uh, NASA is warning, is this the calm before the storm? We were just talking about this. And uh, that the sun is unexpectedly quiet. And that's what that's uh, March 9th, 2013. Something unexpected, in quotes, is happening to the sun. NASA has warned this year is supposed to be the solar maximum. That's kind of what we talked about, so I'm not going to get into that too much. NASA can't explain why the sun's doing that. Some people are trying to say, yeah, it's a it's – a, it's, it's going to be a double peak. 2011 wasn't really a peak when you go back and look at, at solar cycle 23. Then um, the, uh, the NASA satellite finds the Earth clouds are getting lower. That's February 2012. The Earth is losing its magnetic field. That's been happening for decades. This story came out 10 uh, October 2012. It says uh, the magnetic field surrounding the Earth is weakening, and that's been happening for quite some time. The sun's heliosphere is shrinking. And weakening. That's January 2010. New data has revealed the heliosphere, the protective shield of energy that surrounds our solar system, has weakened by 25 percent over the last decade. Now, yeah, for people cow. who don't understand what a helios field is, just imagine the sun with a big giant bubble that's around the whole solar system. It's sort of the it's sort of the the outskirts of where the sun's power and energy stop. So, if people can think of a giant bubble. So these are really big things, what Terrell is talking about, uh, that's happening. Go ahead. And the fact that they're happening over such a short period. So this is an influence that has to be local. It cannot be something that's galactic. It, it, going to the center of the galactic plane, that is something that would be very, very gradual. You wouldn't even be able to measure it in a 25-year period. Or uh, over a decade, 25%, you know, that is ridiculous. There's something that's going on here. So I'm, I'm helping you to build a picture to give you a baseline so I can take, reveal to you what NASA and the Department of Homeland Security are doing to keep you uninformed. Okay, uh, the, the key word that you're going to watch is interplanetary shockwave. Interplanetary shockwave. That's what some government agency, that's what some disinformation crony has decided they're going to use to try to explain away these phenomena. A Saturn experienced a quote-unquote interplanetary shockwave because its magnetosphere turned around like the Earth did. That's how they're explaining it. And the most important event of 2012 was when the magnetosphere turned around for 28 hours. That Why don't you explain, Terrell, real quick, the why this is so important. This is probably the the most telling, the hardcore evidence that this black dwarf is coming into our solar system and it's going to create all this havoc. But tell them about the magnetosphere and how it works. Okay. Oh, this is evidence that it's, it's, it's pretty close. I can't say how close, depending on how big it is. But this is, this is the evidence. The uh, magnet, magnetosphere is a magnetic bubble. The, the, uh, the, there's a magnetic bubble around our solar system that has a bow shock. It's just think of the front of your boat, the bow shock. It's compressed by the interstellar wind. Then it has a tail that sticks out the back that's like a lady's hair blowing in the wind. The same thing with the magnetosphere. The bow shock faces the sun. It's pushed, it's compressed by the solar wind, and the tail points in the opposite direction. So what happened on March the 12th and 13th, 2012, is the magnetic bubble that surrounds our, our planet, the bow shock turned around and faced right in between the Leo and the Virgo constellations. The tail pointed at the sun. It was characterized by suspicious observers uh, and relic, part of Timothy Paul's group, as a magnetopause reversal. So that's what you want a keyword to be able to look up that event of what happened. Now, yeah, let me, well, uh, let me just jump in here. Basically what Paul's saying is that the Earth's magnetic sphere, a bubble, it ha it's like hair. And on the front of it, it's compressed, and it always points at the sun. The sun gives out these solar winds. 
it compresses it so it's like a flag on a flagpole it always flies away from the sun always never does it do anything else but do that what happened on that particular day for 28 hours the 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 direction of the hair from because of the solar wind blowing, blowing it in one direction away from the sun actually reversed and went towards the sun for 28 hours which is like a miracle it is impossible unless this black dwarf star uh, has, is responsible for it. So that's what he's talking about. Now, an update. Go ahead, Terrell. Yeah. The, uh, so, yeah, what seems impossible happened, and if it was just for an hour, then it could possibly be from a hot flow anomaly. If you look up Venus, it's, it's possible that that's something like that could happen. But the, and the, the gamma ray burst hypothesis, if it was a short duration, then that's possible. But a 28, a 23 to 28 hour duration, that is impossible from an influence outside of the heliosphere. And I explain that in this uh, volume number 11 newsletter that I just released today. You can get that at terralo3.com of why it's impossible and that the influence must be local. So the, um, what I'm getting to here, the interplanetary shock wave, that's the lingo that's being used to describe the distortions in the magnetosphere. But data is being removed from me and you so that I can't do my work. This is the response. This is from one of my guys that watched the magnetosphere for me. He posted uh, information to NASA. He wanted to know why the information was removed. This yeah, is what they said. It, Terrell. Let me set it up because you went too fast. So basically, I'm, lo I'm looking at the clock. Right, right. Well, uh, that's okay. Um, uh, oh, yeah, I see. But I'm just saying for the people to understand that uh, there are machines that actually watch the magnetosphere that NASA and the government has. And that, that's how we know. Well, we got a break coming up. And so when we get on the other side of the break, uh, we're going to tell you what the government machine said and then what they did. And this is, this is very telling. We'll be right back in about two minutes. Hey, welcome back, folks. You're listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. This is um, edition 166 of Changing Reality, where I try to do the most important things. Uh, normally, I would you know, talk about some fundraising a little bit for the station, but I'm going to say that for the next hour. Uh, I got something special uh, that I want to do, I want to talk about um, right now. But, Terrell, can you give your information out and where they can get a hold of you and where they can support you? Yes, the way to support the research is to go to terrell03.com and become a newsletter subscriber. And it's, it's a great, great deal. You get all of the, all 52 issues from 2012. That includes the Dead Astronomy Report from Stu Noodle. It's very comprehensive. About 70 astronomers have been – that are engaged – have been – they were engaged in dark star imaging research, murdered or missing. Um, very comprehensive report. You also get some work from Michael Owens. He was my chief astronomer, feature writer for the newsletter before he was taken from my group mysteriously on April the 2nd, 2012, exactly one year before our alignment date. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And as, a, as another reason why I believe that we're not looking at a crossing event, I mean, I hate to say for sure, 100% for sure, but it's, I believe, because artificial intelligence is telling me by what he's doing, that there's another orbit cycle. But anyway, um, there, there's a lot of information there. The, the mystery illness uh, PDF files, that explains a lot about HARP, explains what it really is. The uh, nanotechnologies that are in your body right now, it explains the, the nanofilament replication inhibitor how to protect yourself uh, from what's going on all around us. I have a little bit more information on that from Billy Hayes a little bit later in the show. Um, but that's how you support me and my research by becoming a subscriber. And there's a lot of benefits. I work with you on Skype. I will do threat analysis for you, threat assessment, contingency planning, and help you find a safe zone location if that's what you want. Uh, if you're a Christian, I, mean, I hear from Christians all the time, I'm going to get raptured. I don't need it. And I'm like, cool. You know, I can be raptured from, any, from Florida or from Arkansas in my, for, uh, from my safe zone. So that's the best way you can support me, terrorly3.com, and there's a lot of information there. Project Black Star, that's what I'm working on for the last – this is now my third year. The Dakota Report's there where the lettered agency, lettered agency operatives, pardon me, they describe Project Black Star that uh, the reason they're releasing that report is to avert genocide related to Project Black Star. That's when I realized that's uh, – that I did five years of 9-11 research. My book is also in the Dropbox folder that you received from being a uh, newsletter subscriber. And um, 
I presented some of that information today in the video. If you go to Terrell03 on YouTube, it's Terrell03 is my channel. Uh, Google shut down my YouTube account. So that's the best way to support me. And um, I hope you guys will become newsletter subscribers and, and support the research. Now let's get back to the magnetosphere and what the government's done, um, or what they've decided to do. Okay. Um, this is what uh, this is what I expected. So there's there are different scenarios that NASA could could uh, could carry out in order to hide what's happening. One of them is just to turn off the servers. Because starting in February, that's whenever we started getting these quote unquote um, uh, what the uh, interplanetary shock waves. That's what they're calling them. So that's the the, Earth, the magnetosphere was trying to turn around. But it has to do with the angle. So we got to deflect. We're at the wrong angle in February, in uh, early February still. February the 5th is whenever we had an anomaly. And then February 16th, we had another anomaly. I, uh, that's called an interplanetary shock wave. If, if you uh, go to suspicious observers on February the 17th, you'll see that he makes note of it. Um, so as we get – now we're coming in between the sun and this object. The, the anomaly becomes more pronounced. Because no longer is the sun deflecting what's happening. So when we're at outside orbit at either side, that was June 24th last year, 2012. That was December 28, 2012. When we're on the right angle, the solar wind blasting past us covers us. The whole time we're behind the sun, the solar wind covers us. It's a gigantic electromagnetic field. And the solar wind itself blankets us from this anomaly from happening. The solar wind is actually going in the same direction as the wind of the black star. But when we come between the two stars, then the star, it, it has electromagnetic arms. The subatomic particles are having difficulty leaving the high gravity environment and it's rotating. So the arms that are on the top and the bottom are kind of are stringy. But the ones on the side with the rotation, they've gathered together and they create these arms. And as things spins around, then if you look down on it, it looks like a hurricane and it has bands that come around. That's one of those arms swung through, turned our magnetosphere around. So it regathers the protons, subatomic particles from the sun, and it redirects them back in our direct, you know, through our magnetosphere. And the force of that arm coming through is actually stronger than the solar wind. But if, if you've been watching the Weather Channel, you're looking at hurricanes. Whenever they come on shore, they have these outer bands, these arms that come on. So it storms and then it's calm. Then it storms and it's calm. But that's the effect. That's what's happening. But we have to come around in orbit, which we are now. So this, what, what the, uh, the Department of Homeland Security and NASA are doing is what I expected to happen. But they're, let me just go ahead and read it to you. This is what they said. Uh, my guy that watches the, um, the uh, magnetosphere, he interacts with NASA. And he, and he asks questions for him. He wants to know what the heck's going on. How come we're, you know, we're, we're being blindfolded here? This is what they wrote. It says, from Administrative Department from NASA. We apologize for the freeze because that's what they're doing, freezing the information, and they're not letting us see what's happening. They say, unfortunately, there are some unusual coronal video co – uh, let me start again. Unfortunately, there are some unusual coronal video correction anomalies spotted in the stereographic live streams needing attention. Archived images for dates of March 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th. 7th and 8th have been omitted from the record pursuant to Joint Homeland Security NASA Directive. Corrected imagery for the anomalous coronal keyframes in question have not been cleared for public dissemination and likely to remain unavailable until further notice. So whenever they're Whenever they turn off the magnetosphere simulators for a day or two at the time, they did it up to three days on the last cycle, then I can use that data to know when the arms are coming through. But whenever they're deleting five days and six days in a row, then I can't tell. So it's, it's difficult for me to be able to say exactly when these arms are coming in and predict when the next one's going to happen with this happening. But right, so let me, just, let me just qualify what you're saying to the audience. So basically... The magnetosphere, we talked about, it's like hair of a woman. The sun always blows it outward. But when we get between this dark star, this black star, and the sun, like last year, it reversed for 23 to 28 hours or whatever, and the magnetosphere, the hair went the other way towards the sun. A miracle. 
Now we're coming back around one year later. We're in that same position. And so Terrell and his guys are watching these machines, these satellites, and this imagery just to see if there's a switch. And so all of them, what NASA does is they say, cut. You don't get the information for five, six days. And also, by the way, there's nothing we can do about it because Homeland Security is crying national security. So forget it. So in other words, they didn't even try to trick them with like old feedback loops or something like that. They didn't even try that. They just said, you're not even going to get the information. I mean, that in itself is the biggest fingerprint oh, next to what happened last year that this Black Dwarf star is coming through. I mean, that's crazy stuff. Go ahead, Terrell. And the fact that Department of Homeland Security is even involved tells yeah. me that there is a object in space that is that has given them this authority. In 2009, the law was passed saying that NASA must turn over the any information related to an inbound object to the Department of Defense. They're not allowed to tell the public. So there's no other reason I can think of that the Department of Homeland Security is interrupting and interfering in my ability to monitor the magnetosphere in the sun other than it connected to a directive that, that gives them authority based upon an inbound object. But you notice something, Terrell, and the government keeps on doing this. And um, this is Nighthawk's theory. This might also be your theory, but Nighthawk has a theory that if you're smart enough um, and you're going to prepare enough um, and you're watching, I mean, why would Homeland Security even, you know, it's like the people who actually watch this stuff and are concentrating on it. It's almost like they're saying, by the way, uh, we're involved in it and what you're thinking is correct. And if you're smart enough to put all the pieces to the puzzle together, then um, uh, good, wake up, you may survive. Um, and it's almost like Homeland Security, they had to stick their nose in this to sort of say, here we are. If you're smart enough to see it, you, you monkeys out there, go ahead, try to survive. We'll, we'll let you if you're smart enough, go ahead. Whenever this object is here, then I believe that they just let it all go. As long as there's another orbit cycle, then it's too early. Because the, the, remember that we're dealing, I want to get into this just a little bit, the, uh, what we're dealing with is artificial intelligence. They're monitoring, every, he monitors everything. And he is, his job is to ensure the security of the underground Ark City programs for the House of Rothschild around the world. So the lettered agencies, they're just little chickens in the chicken house. It's not the government. It's not the government that you need to worry about. The government is incompetent. They cannot even keep an illegal alien out of the White House. They're incompetent. The illegal aliens are running around everywhere. It's the fascist. It's the Hughes Raytheon. It's Blackstone. Uh, it's the, the bought and paid for mercenaries, the private armies. Those are the guys. They've got things out in space that people don't even know about that the government is incapable of putting out there. And what they have is artificial intelligence that's been doing threat assessment for the lettered agencies since the mid-1970s. They also have the nanotechnology that is inside of your body right now and that they're able to manipulate. Artificial intelligence is able to manipulate through the HARP medium. There's a lot of HARP infrastructure that's going up right now that people aren't aware of. And thank God for Billy Hayes. He's a, he's uh, he's he just put an article here. There's a new facility that's been built in Fairmont, West Virginia. He, he writes that the site contains 100 meter multiband HR slash UHF slash UUHF dish at 15 megawatts traceable laser maser of 20 megawatts for command and powering of. UAVs in space utilizing new plasma propulsion engine systems as described by Mark McCandish. So there's a, it, this story is a gigantic rabbit hole. And if I, if I lead you down there, you can get lost. It's pretty easy. But uh, just to give you the basics of it, artificial intelligence, they're building an infrastructure around this planet in space. And it's the, in the old days they, with HARP, a lot of people think HARP is something in Alaska. It's not. There's there's now 325 HARP facilities that have been built around the world. The new infrastructure includes a band that goes around the equator in space all the way around, and they're bouncing stuff off of there. It's no longer limited to just inside the atmosphere. 
and the Harper Raid were involved with the Chile event, the, the uh, Fukushima event, and the Guerrero event for the last three years. And I've been saying that the Harper Raids are maintained by the Navy, and they position around the epicenter, and they pound the ground 24 to about two dozen times, with four, and they create four to six magnitude quakes. I'm expecting that that's going to happen on April the 2nd. I'm expecting that the, the Harper Rays are going to be deployed, but it's possible that they won't be deployed. But between March the 1st and the 15th, and there, the HARP is running a gigantic test, and it looks like that they're going to be powering up this new infrastructure. And I'm not surprised they're doing it in the month of March because in the month of April, the beginning of April, I think is whenever they're going to bring it online, and they're going to have it online and ready to use for this event. It's going to be Pacific Ocean. It's going to happen right around April the 2nd, whenever we pass between those two stars. They know the moment that we're going to pass through it, going about 66,000 miles per hour, and they're going to create the environment for either amplifying the effect or dampening the effect. It's either going to be the Guerrero effect, which is the dampener, or it's going to be the Fukushima effect, which is going to be the amplification. So I don't know which they're going to do yet, but I know it's going to be Pacific Ocean, and I know that they know the location, and it's possible, like in Guerrero, that they're running a war game at uh, the Guerrero event, at the epicenter. They they started the war game, and then the event happened an hour later. So it's I haven't been I haven't had it in my mind to get out there and check yet to see, find out where along the Ring of Fire it's going to be Pacific Ocean Ring of Fire event definitely, but I haven't uh, looked see where they're pre war gaming for a big quake event. So um, another reason I was I alluded to it a little bit before. With my mom passing away. See, some of you guys don't know that the reason Terrell's research group was dissolved, I had hundreds of members last year, and it was dissolved in the month of March. Uh, my members were going down, and it was definitely because of nanotechnology. There, um, I, I don't know how much of the details that, I, that some of the people don't want to be named. They're scared that, because the stuff's going to happen again. What I'm doing is pushing the envelope because artificial intelligence is telling me if this thing's here or not. You know, I, I, my mother now. He, that's what he may be doing. He may be. That's what he he may be telling me that it's not here yet, and I better shut my mouth. Um, if this thing was here, you see. But then, is it a coincidence or is it not a coincidence? The um, my mother never had a heart condition before until she went into the hospital the same time as Michael Owens last March. She went into the hospital again with uh, the European correspondent doesn't want to be named. Um, and he was in the hospital seven weeks, and he had multiple heart attacks, and he's 34 years old last year. There's no reason for it. Another member of my family, don't want to mention her name, heart attack. No reason why. just don't know why. She has no plaque in her system. Her heart is completely healthy. She's a completely healthy person. She's in the hospital. She's not right now, she, but they're running tests on her now to find out why. They don't know why. And I've given them a little bit of information so that, that uh, I hope that they'll look at her at the, the scrapings under electron microscope because I'm pretty darn sure what they're going to find. They're going to find nanotechnology inside of them. And that's what they've been doing to people for quite some time now. And uh, I can uh, list the symptoms for you. It's flu-like symptoms and then uh, leads to respiratory failure and then it leads to heart attack. And I'm I'm very confident that the uh, death report of my mother is going to mirror Michael Owens. And well, uh, just to, uh, just to just to kind of put a fact in here, um, Terrell. It turns out that it highly it's proportionally women. Um, they don't die as often as men of heart attacks, but when they get their first heart attack, it takes out. It's like 70, 80 percent of women when they do have one versus men. Men seem to be able to survive the first heart attack. And even the second, um, for whatever reason. But women, when they get their first heart attacks, uh, um, are usually fatal. But go ahead. Now she had her first one last year. That's what I'm saying. In the month of March, when she went into the hospital with Michael Owens. Oh, I see. And she lost 50 pounds, and she was doing good. And that's why it says that she died suddenly. Well, I, I just was talking to her, and the next minute she's dead. But um, you know, I can't prove it. But whenever 13 people go down at the same time in the month of March last year, then – and they have these symptoms. I mean some of them are just found unconscious, perfectly healthy people, found unconscious, taken to the hospital. They're in the hospital a week, up to seven weeks, perfectly healthy people. Then the, the, uh, there's something wrong. The, the law of probability says that's impossible for three people 
much less 13 people. So that's why that the group was dissolved this year. And I, I see people uh, over, I was over suspicious observer site going, yeah, it's research group, you know, there's only a few people and this and that. Yeah, it's going to stay that way too. That's, uh, I don't mind. I come out here on the radio show. I put myself right into harm's way because I want to wake people up and I'm going to, I'm going to know what the truth is myself. It's like, can, I, can, I, can I interject for one second? This is uh, sure. Mike. Uh, I'm on the line. Um, this Homeland Security has enough ammunition right now to fight a war with the American people for, I think, seven years. It's over a million rounds of ammunition. Um, I'd like you to comment on that. And also, uh, I have a background in uh, Catholicism, and I remember Padre Pio, um, and I remember Fatima, and I remember the three days of darkness. And is there a a uh, connection between um, when this when the when the um, three days of darkness happens, if it's associated with the dark with the twin binary star, will elect, all electricity will not work? And could this be a possibility? And uh, and I I wish you would uh, research that too. Uh, could you compare those two things? Yeah, I would have to speculate on the second a little bit. I have to gather more data for you because uh, there's not a reference book to go to. To research that exactly what's going to happen. But, I mean, we can have an electromagnetic pulse uh, from a, uh, a burst from the sun uh, anytime. And it's, it seems to be happening in March and in September. Next class flares. We get a big one. That could happen. That could happen anytime. Not associated with any darkness or anything like that. The my my theory on the darkening sun from the influence of the dark star is still forming. I, I really can't give you a view on that. I know. In a perihelion slash alignment event, when the Earth tips backwards from the sun, we can see three days of darkness. That's been my leading explanation for the last couple of years. But watching the sun, I believe that the sun's going to be a more of a barometer than I suspected earlier, and that these coronal holes are going to continue to get larger and larger and larger till this thing gets right next to it, and then the sun goes out. The um, the problem with that theory is it's likely going to be. Uh, near perihelion position nearest the sun for longer than a three-day period. And I wouldn't be able to explain a short duration um, outage of the sun but because the proximity is going to be close for longer than that. So that's the problem with with that aspect um, of the three days of darkness. With, with your bullet thing, there are also hollow point bullets. Then those are not used for practice rounds to keep people qualified. And you don't need billions of them. In order to do that, yeah, two billion, and yeah. My view on that is that is going to be a stockpile that we're going to use against them. The Department of Homeland Security is greatly underestimating the the creativity of the American people and the people that that uh, uh, that know what liberty is and what lone wolf is going to do to them, because there are tens of thousands of lone wolves in the United States, and they are going to mobilize. And these people are going to die in their sleep, and we're going to take their bullets. Uh, I'm really not concerned about the Department of Homeland Security. I would be more concerned about the um, contractor, the, the, uh, the, the kill squads that work for Halliburton, Blackstone, and uh, TRW, Hughes Raytheon. It's the fascist people that you need to be, I think, more afraid of. They have more high-tech stuff than the, um, the uh, than Department of Homeland Security. Um, and we can infiltrate the Department of Homeland Security. More difficult to do, to infiltrate these um, contract killers. Then you see what I mean. So I would be more and more worried about that. Maybe your focus is on the Department of, Department of Homeland Security, which I believe is a smaller threat as a smokescreen to keep you from looking for what the real threat is. And that's going to be the House of Rothschild, the Council on Foreign Relations Super Soldier Program. See, if they want to kill you, they don't need a bullet. They can do that with artificial intelligence and a binary weapon. That's a uh, that's going to be a virus, a super virus. And but it, it, what they're going to do is send out a carrier strain first, and everybody's going to get it. Just the people with immunodeficiency disorders are going to be killed by it. It's going to be a very very small percentage of the population. That virus is going to displace the reg the uh, the other flu viruses that are in the system. Everybody's going to have it, but you're not even going to have a symptom. But then. Artificial intelligence is going to come along, and it, it's going to be a recombinant. It's going to be probably a triple-triple recombinant, um, like the pig flu, bird flu strain, and then it's going to mutate. And then they're going to have the artificial intelligence is going to – it's already inside of your body right now, the nanobots. 
what they're doing is they're breaking the five nanometer barrier and then artificial intelligence using the heart medium they have a 1.5 hertz carrier wave that's being altered right now by the way 70 285 feet tall and they multi-frequency 350 sub-frequencies on top of that and that's what artificial intelligence uses to communicate to the nanomaterials that are inside of you then the missing component for the binary weapon from the carrier strain is going to be the amino acids there's probably going to be two amino acids that's what was missing from the swine flu 2010 two amino acids is all it needed to become a deadly killer so the the uh, the fascists People that work for the House of Rothschild, they use artificial intelligence to identify you as a threat, and then they kill you individually with this virus. The um, nanites, the nanobots are inside of you. Make sure that you're dead, and you can or don't have to kill those around you. So it's going to be person-specific using the uh, DNA combinations in your body, or it's going to be family-specific or a race-specific kind of killer. So the bullet thing, Department of Homeland Security – not a threat. The the super soldier program from the Council on Foreign Relations, that's where the threat is. So this this other stuff they're they're putting out on the stage for you to see, that's like that you're watching the puppet. You need to be able to see the puppeteer. That's the guy that has the weapons that in the background that you don't even know about. So if you can't identify the threat, then you cannot create the contingent contingency plan to neutralize the threat, and that's what they're counting on. So they're giving you, you know, the, uh, the these things. They're parading things out there for you to look at. And as soon as they parade in front of your eye, you have to realize that's the puppet. Then you start searching for the puppeteer, and then you can start waking up to really, uh, really what's going on here. Now, I hate to even tell you more about the super soldier program and the uh, the nanomaterials and stuff like that because it would really make people just want to give up. And then you're going to realize that God has to intervene. In this thing somewhere, but uh, the, the Department of Homeland Security, the bullets, and uh, their their men, you know, the literal men that sleep at night, not worrying about them at all. I, I believe Lone Wolf and the American people can handle any threat, whether it's Chinese, whether it's our own military, whether it's Russian military. I think we can handle all of that. It's these super weapons that the uh, CFR has, their working groups. That's the real threat. Yeah, well, listen, Terrell, uh, we're coming up to a break. If you want to ride over, we can ride over. Um, or, or if you don't, uh, you can give your information out. Uh, what do you want to do? Yeah, it's 1 o'clock in the morning here. I'd love to stay in with you, but I probably should be responsible and, uh, and, and shut her down. So um, you can help support the research. The inf kind of information that I give you is in the Dropbox folder at uh, – when you become a newsletter subscriber, you get links to the 2012 folder, 2013 folder. You become a newsletter subscriber, and uh, that's the only way that you can support my research. That's $25 for two years. If you um, if you don't have $25 to become a regular subscriber with the with the all the benefits for doing threat assessment and all that, if you just want access to the PDFs and just make any donation, go to terrorlord3.com. Go down to the bottom. You see it down there at the bottom. Just make any donation in uh, five or ten bucks or whatever, and I will send you the Dropbox folder links because I really, really want you to have the information. Okay, well, we appreciate it so much, Terrell, and um, uh, we will see you next um, Thursday. So um, uh, take care and get emotionally healed up, okay? Thank you very much, Hijacker. I'll see you next week. Okay, alrighty. Bye-bye.